Hotel, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel. Join me Saturday, February 18th, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time for another free Black History Month lecture, Black Resistance Movements in the Fight for Freedom from 1630 BC and Antiquity to 2023 today, Attacks on Voting Rights and Teaching African American History. This is another free lecture that I'm doing for Black History Month. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or click on the link here. If you missed last week's uh, free lecture as well, it's archived. You can go watch it also. We're going to deal with uh, thousands of years of history of Africans fighting against invasions, Africans fighting against white supremacy, whether it's the Hyksos invasion in ancient Kemet, whether it's uh, Hannibal Barca and the Carthaginians fighting against uh, the Romans in the Punic Wars, Queen and Zynga fighting against the Portuguese in the 1620s and 1630s, uh, whether we talk about Emperor Menelik II fighting against uh, Italy and the Battle of Attawa. We're going to break down these battles and look at present day battles also. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Then join me at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for class number two of my 12 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Right now, it's correct. Your own behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Hotel. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Saturday, February 4th, 2023. And we are here for a very special presentation I'm going to do today. It's Black History Month, African American History Month. So uh, I'm going to do a presentation today uh, that deals with this year's annual theme for African American History Month, which is Black Resistance. So we're going to deal with black resistance and black resistance movements. And we're going to do three main things today. OK. And can everybody hear me? All right. We're going to do three main things today. We're going to deal with some of the history of African-American History Month or Black History Month and talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who created uh, what was known as Negro History Week in 1926. And uh, it, it started the second week of 1926. And then it became Black History Month nationwide in 1976. So we'll talk about some of the history of uh, Black History Month. Then we'll deal with this year's annual theme, which is Black Resistance. And there's been an annual theme for African American History Month or Black History Month since 1928. Since 1928. Okay. Then we'll talk about uh, a new... 12 week online course that uh, I'm starting on Saturday, uh, February 11th, next Saturday, Saturday, February 11th, which will be 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And this is a 12 week online class that I've taught periodically since 2017. And we have some new content, so we'll give you information about that and how you can register for this new 12-week online course that starts up with class number one on Saturday, February 11th, 2023, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so can everybody, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, that, let me start with that first. Can everybody hear me okay? You should be able to hear me and see me, okay? And uh, Gilbert Ross, how you doing, Gilbert? Gilbert's been rolling with me and watching my lectures and things like this for some time. Uh, we'll come back to your question, Gilbert, okay? Uh, you can uh, post your comments here as well. We're going to get your comments in uh, also. And uh, I'll, I'll give you some recommendations on books uh, as well. Now, at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, I have a... A recommended reading list of about 70 books there and some of these books about uh, probably seven of them we use in my online classes and uh, the class that starts up next Saturday ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade okay all right so uh, also I'm gonna give you I was updating my annual article dealing with Black History Month I'm gonna give you that link because it's an extensive article I've written it's about seven pages uh, that deals with uh, Black History Month and the origins of it um, and some of the myths that people put out about, about Black History Month as well. 
All right, so some of you see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, I was on Roland's show yesterday, okay, and he gave me 12 seconds to uh, promote today's lecture. I took 22 seconds, all right? Some of you see me on uh, Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture. I'm um, usually on Mondays on, on his show on Roland Martin's network. And then many of you are familiar with me from the African History Network show that I've been doing. It'll be 13 years doing the African History Network show in March, March 10th, 2023. It'll be 13 years of me doing uh, the African History Network show, hosting that show that I created. Okay, so uh, I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. And I want to go, and I, st yeah, I was doing, I uh, started out with Harambe, Harambe Radio Network um, in uh, March 10th, 2010. Uh, Delani Am Aman um, ran the, uh, he owned the Harambe Radio Network, and he just passed away a few months ago. So he's an ancestor now. Then I went over to Blog Talk Radio. Akhenaten Thomas said, I I've been listening since you were on Blog Talk Radio. Yeah, I, used, I was on Blog Talk Radio uh, doing it live. Now we uh, still uh, upload the audio podcast on my various broadcasts. We still upload that to um, uh, my Blog Talk radio page, which is uh, the African History Network show, the African History Network show. OK, so you can check that out uh, on Blog Talk radio. All right. Now. Um, OK, let me go to the PowerPoint presentation here. Just a second here. I want to get this up. All right, so uh, you can post your questions and comments here. We'll get to uh, we'll get to your questions and comments. Uh, I want to go to the slideshow, uh, to the slide presentation that I have here, and I, I have uh, a few different slide presentations I'm going to work between, and I have some articles I'm going to share with you as well. Uh, whenever I have these presentations, whenever I do these presentations, whenever I speak virtually or in public, especially dealing with African American History Month, I like to show this clip here of uh, Malcolm X. And it's Malcolm X asking the question of who are you? Who are you? OK. And this helps to. Um, th this helps to. Set the tone for today's presentation today's conversation and for us to understand why our history is so important okay um so let me go to this let me go to this clip here let's see okay let me go to this clip here of uh, malcolm x and this is malcolm asking the question of who are you you don't know don't tell me negro that's not oh, let me back it up here who are you? You don't know. Don't tell me Negro. That's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? What tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb as you are right now? African Americans. African Americans, African Americans, who are so-called Negro. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that it is bad for us to continue to just refer to ourselves as so-called Negro, that's negative. When we say so-called Negro, that's pointing out what we aren't, but it isn't telling us what we are. We are African, and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. We... Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We were brought here against our will. We were not brought here to be made citizens. 
We were not brought here to enjoy the uh, constitutional gifts that they speak so beautifully about today. And because we weren't brought here to be made citizens today, now that we've become awakened to some degree and we begin to ask for those things which they say are supposedly for Americans, they look upon us with hostility and unfriendliness. So our unwanted presence, the fact that we are unwanted, is becoming magnified in all of America's preachments today. All right. So that was the one and only Malcolm X. Okay, now, um, who has seen those two clips of Malcolm before? Uh, or who has not seen those two clips of Malcolm before? Let me know. Have you seen those before? Besides me showing them, because I showed them in my presentations. But besides me showing them, um, who has uh, seen those clips before? And the reason why I like to show those clips is because a lot of times when it comes to uh, Black History Month, okay, African American History Month, a lot of times when it comes to uh, this celebration, you have people who will say, like Morgan Freeman said back in 2006, I think it was 2006, I don't want a Black History Month. Uh, or they'll say things like, uh, why we have the shortest month of the year. Uh, they're just really ignorant things like this. Now, hopefully Morgan Freeman has learned that his comments to Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes were false. Okay, hopefully he's learned that. But when Malcolm asked this question of who are you, it starts to make you think about what happened to us and how we were stripped largely of our history, culture, language, spiritual systems, names, family ties, uh, mores, nationality, land, etc. Okay, and he asked the question, who are you? Don't tell me Negro. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? What happened to our names? What happened to our culture? What happened to our land? What happened to our history? What were the methods? What were the methods that were used to make us as dumb as we are right now? Okay. So I show this when I speak across the country and I play this on my radio show before that many times before. And it causes people to sit there and say, damn, sit there and really think about this. Right? So, Black History Month, African American History Month, because the name was officially changed to African American History Month a few years ago, by ASALA, which is Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Okay, um, this is why Dr. Carter G. Woodson created this celebration in 1926 in the first place, because he was an educator, and he realized that African Americans did not know their history, and our children did not know our history or their history. And it was never designed to be the only time of the year that we study our history. It was designed to be a celebration of our history, of our accomplishments, of our achievements. And in schools, it was supposed to be a time of the year that children demonstrated what they had been studying year round because he said, Dr. Dr. Woodson said, it didn't make sense just to study our history one week out of the year. It, we're supposed to study our history in our schools year round. And Negro History Week was supposed to be a period of time where you have celebrations and our school children demonstrate what they've been studying year round. Okay, we have it totally backwards. And we're going to get deep in, in, into this because Dr. Woodson was brilliant. And I, and I argue he's very much underrated. And unfortunately, a lot of African-American History Month uh, celebrations or Black History Month celebrations take place. And his name is not even mentioned, which is the, which is the height of disrespect to him. That people, and, and, and not only that. But when I when I speak at different events and, and throughout the, the years, going back to uh, probably 2012. So it would be like 11 years now and speaking at different events. And I speak at churches, also a church. I was while I was playing that clip, I was responding to a text message from a deacon at a church that I've spoken at numerous times before. And he said, he said, the pastor wants to know you have any dates available to speak for Black History Month. Right. So. I speak at churches also. 
But usually when I speak at these different events, I ask the people, what is this year's annual theme for Black History Month? Nobody can tell me unless they listen to my show and they don't know there's an annual theme. Okay. So now the second clip here of Malcolm is from the second clip is from 1963. I think that's from the Ballad of the Bullet, that second clip. One, he uses the term African-American. Yeah, that's from the Ballad of the Bullet. He uses the term African-American. The term African-American was not created by Reverend Jesse Jackson. Please stop spreading that myth. That is blatantly false and shows a lack of understanding of history. Reverend Jackson and African-American scholars reintroduced the term African-American. The term African-American goes back to first recorded usage, goes back to May 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. We were using the term African-American during the 1960s. Professor Jane Small, who's one of my teachers, has told me this personally. But as we see, Malcolm used, used it here because we were using that term. Also, the term Afro-American was not created in the 1960s. That dates back to the 1830s. And if you've, if you've taken the second class that I teach called uh, From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1800 to 1968, we deal with the creation of the National Afro-American League in 1892, which was basically the first civil rights organization we had, 1892. This is before the NAACP. This is before, in 1909. This is before the Niagara Movement in 1905. OK, the National Afro-American League in 1892, they used the term Afro-American. Then in 1898, Bishop Alexander Walters and T. Thomas Fortune come up, uh, create a new organization which picks up from where the National Afro-American League left off. And this is called the Afro-American Council in 1898. So we, we don't understand history. We don't understand our history. As well as the history of this country, OK? Now, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay? So, so this is why this history is so important. African history and culture gives, gives us our foundation. It gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs, as two of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small, correctly teach us. It gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. Okay? This influences our economic empowerment and influences our political empowerment. Okay? And, I, and I'll show you the pyramid principle here as well. Okay? I'm just, I'm just warming up. OK, I haven't even <laughs> I'm just warming up. This is this is like the uh, cartoon. Well, you know, I don't, they don't show that a lot now, but this is like the cartoon before the main feature of, of the movie. OK, so we're just getting warmed up. All right. You can post your questions here. We'll come to your questions here shortly. OK, we'll come to your questions shortly. Um, and so Malcolm used the term Af African-American. Now, I love Malcolm. You see a picture of Malcolm behind me. And also, I recommend people read this book here, Malcolm X Speaks. Uh, of course, the autobiography of Malcolm X, that goes without saying, the autobiography of Malcolm X. But also, Malcolm X Speaks, uh, with edit, edited with prefatory notes by uh, George Brightman, because this deals with speeches from Malcolm um, largely after he leaves the Nation of Islam. They have a message to the grassroots in here from 63, Battle of the Bullet as well. And he delivers the Battle of the Bullet uh, March 29th, 1964, uh, three days after he meets Dr. King for the first and only time, which was March 26, 1964, at the U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights Act. Okay. Malcolm uh, officially separates from the Nation of Islam March 8th, 1964. So he delivers the ballot or the bullet uh, late March 64 and then April 3rd, 64, in um, Cleveland, Ohio, a Coy Methodist church. And then April 4th, 1964, at uh, King Solomon Baptist Church here in Detroit. And I just spoke at King Solomon Baptist Church uh, January 1st, 2023, for the last day of Kwanzaa. All right. Now, uh, Malcolm did not talk about the African presence in this country tens of thousands of years before 
even Native Americans come into existence or tens of thousands of years ago. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So he's basically dealing with it from the perspective of the transatlantic slave trade. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade did happen, but this was our land stolen from us. African people have been in this land that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. And we know Native Americans and, and uh, other groups called this Turtle Island, all right? But this was our land stolen from us. So if we go beyond the history of just 500 years and we go back 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 years ago, okay, we're, we're going to see that the only people here at one, at one point in time were African people. Okay, and the and and, and uh, the the oldest remains of Homo sapiens in this land are of the Khoisan, and the Khoisan come from southern Africa, and they're the ancestors to the and the Twa. They go all around the world, and they were here in this land. Okay, so if you read uh, the first Americans were Africans, uh, this book right here, the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence by one of my friends, Dr. David M. Hotel, and I've interviewed him probably thirteen, fourteen times. This came out in 2011. His new book, The First Americans Were Africans, Revised and Expanded, came out uh, in late 20, late 2021, about October 2021 or so. This deals with that history. It's a documented history of this, okay? All right, so um, let's continue here. Now, anytime I speak, I know I may say some things that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because you never heard them before, disagree with them, or don't like them does not mean that they're not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about, okay? So uh, I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. I usually say something like this. The space inside, my cir uh, space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. Now, the reason why I say that is because oftentimes when people hear something that contradicts what they've been taught, what they believe, or what they think they know, a lot of times they automatically reject it without doing any research to determine the validity of the new information that they're learning and at the same time, they usually don't use that same level of scrutiny to analyze, critique, or reevaluate what it is they believe or what they think they know. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. All right. So um, hopefully everybody understands that. And, you know, and especially... I have to say this when I when I speak in front of groups uh, that are of different ethnicities, races, uh, things of this nature. OK, because it, I'm, I'm not going to sit up and argue with people that don't know what they're talking about. Also, that's that's the other thing. Uh, so we, we need to really uh, understand history and understand what we're talking about. All right. Let me. Uh, so, so let's continue here. So when we look at Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the creation of Negro History Week, and I hear, you know, uninformed people saying so many negative things uh, about uh, Black History Month and Dr. Woodson, things, things of this nature, okay? So it, it's important to uh, really understand this history. Uh, Dr. Woodson created, founded Negro History Week in 1926. He explained the reason behind the celebration in a pamphlet widely distributed months before uh, the first celebration was to take place during the second week in February in 1926. And it was taking place in commemoration of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass's and Abraham Lincoln's birthdays, okay? Frederick Douglass uh, assumed uh, the birth date of February 14th. Uh, Douglass didn't know his exact birth date. He didn't know the exact year he was born. So, so Frederick Douglass assumed the birth date of February 14th, and Abraham Lincoln's birth date is uh, February 12th. All right. So Dr. Woodson 
chose the second week in February because there were already celebrations going on in the African-American community surrounding those two birth dates, okay? African-Americans have been celebrating um, Frederick Douglass' birthday uh, since uh, Douglass dies in 1895. So starting right around the time Douglas passes away or the next year, we, we, we have celebrations uh, on, on or around Frederick Douglass's birthday. Then also you have those taking place uh, on or around Abraham Lincoln's birthday. These are taking place already in the African-American community. So because you have these celebrations already taking place, Woodson chose the second week of February to have uh, the celebration and ride that momentum. You already have people coming together, things like this. So we can also deal with African-American history at the same time. He didn't, he didn't choose it because it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the shortest month of the year. Has nothing to do with that. Uh, he didn't ask permission from white people if we could have a Negro History Week, which becomes Black History Month. We didn't get permission from white people to do this. This is something that we created, and this comes out of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History uh, that he co-founded, and he was the principal founder, but he co-founded it September 9th, 1915. And this comes out of a, uh, a whole African-American resistance movement. And this is like the uh, academic, uh, intellectual um, uh, resistance that, that we're dealing with, okay? In 1915, this is the beginning of the Great Migration, okay? which is basically about 1915 to 1970. And you have about 6 million African-Americans who migrate from the South up North and out West. And the great migration totally changes the history of this country. This is also 1915 is also the 50th anniversary of the civil war for all practical purposes coming to an end, basically April 9th, 1865, when general Robert E. Lee surrenders to um, um, general Ulysses S. Grant, uh, in Virginia, Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Uh, 1915 is the 50th year anniversary also of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was ratified December 6, 1865, which legally ends chattel slavery in this country. So 1915 is a, is a very pivotal year in this country, okay? And then we know in, um, uh, also in, uh, February 1915, you're going to actually February 8th, 1915, a movie is going to debut from director D.W. Griffith, which revolutionizes motion pictures. It's called The Birth of a Nation, The Birth of a Nation, which debuts February 8th, 1915, okay? And the first 30 days that this movie was out, the movie was called The Klansman. And this, and this movie is going to help rejuvenate the Ku Klux Klan in this country. It's the birth of a nation. So this is the same, this is the whole climate that uh, Dr. Woodson is creating the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. All right, so... Dr. Woodson explained that the reason behind the celebration uh, in a pamphlet widely distributed months before the first celebration was to take place during the second week in February 1926, okay, in commemoration of Frederick Douglass's and Abraham Lincoln's birthdays. Now, Dr. Woodson exclaimed that blacks knew, quote, practically nothing, end quote, about their history. Blacks knew practically nothing about their history. He ultimately believed that African-Americans could benefit immensely from knowledge of their past and accomplishments of their ancestors. Dr. Woodson believed immensely that African-Americans could gain knowledge, from, could benefit from knowledge of our past and accomplishments of our, of our ancestors. He added that race prejudice was the byproduct of whites' beliefs that black people had done, had not contributed anything of worth to world civilization. So what he's talking about is how stereotypes of African-Americans and some of these stereotypes developed during, during slavery. Okay. 
Uh, and we see this uh, represented like in the minstrel shows. Uh, and the minstrel shows go back to about 1828, 1829. A man named T.D. Rice, Th Thomas Dartmouth Rice, um, he creates the Jim Crow character. And the, the, the legend goes that he was, uh, he saw an African American uh, 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 teenage male uh, tending to animals, probably was an uh, enslaved African. And the, 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 the African American teenage male is singing, singing a song, Turn Around, Jump Around, I Jump Just So. Every time I turn around, I jump Jim Crow. So T.D. Rice creates this Jim Crow character. He puts on tattered torn clothes. He puts on blackface to imitate the complexion of African Americans. Okay, and he puts on uh, probably red lipstick to accentuate the lips. And he adopts a Southern dialect. And he does this Jim Crow character which dehumanizes African Americans. And he's imitating enslaved Africans. This is 1828, this is during slavery in this country still in the south uh majority of northern states have already abolished it by this time but many of them are still profiting off of slavery like new york and rhode island and new england with their textile mills you know producing cotton things of this nature the banks in new york wall street in new york things like this they're still profiting off of slavery even though they have abolished slavery in the north and then you're going to have other white men who copy what td rice is doing and T.D. Rice is known as the father of the minstrel shows uh, and, and the father of minstrelsy. And the minstrel shows travel around the country, north and south, but also travel into Europe. And this becomes the most one, one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the country. And it's based upon the dehumanization of African-Americans and showing us as being ignorant and dim-witted, stupid, things of this nature. So what Dr. Woodson is saying is that because African-American history has been suppressed, this allows the stereotypes and the lies and things like this of our people to be projected, not just projected in this country, but actually exported around the world. So Dr. Woodson added that race prejudice was the byproduct of whites' beliefs that black people had not contributed anything of worth to civilization. Okay, now. Dr. Woodson argued that if the historical record was set straight and that if the history of black people were studied along with the achievements of others in schools, not only would African-American youth develop a sense of pride and self-worth, but racism would also be abolished. But racism would also be abolished. Dr. Woodson concluded, quote, let truth destroy the dividing prejudice of nationality and teach universal love without distinction of race, merit, or rank. With sublime enthusiasm and heavenly vision of the great teacher, let us, he's talking about God, the supreme being, with, uh, of the great teacher, let us help men rise above the race hate of their age unto the altruism of a rejuvenated universe unto the altruism of a rejuvenated universe. Now, Negro History Week, as it was originally known, was the first major achievement in popularizing black history and was unique in that it focused on African-American youth. Dr. Carter G. Woodson realized that the miseducation of African-Americans, African people, began in their homes, communities, and elementary schools. Dr. Woodson's vision of Negro History Week was optimistic, strategic, and long-term. Optimistic, strategic, and long-term. He wanted this modest week-long celebration to serve as a stepping stone toward the gradual introduction of black history into the curricula of all levels of the U.S. educational system. And Dr. Woodson felt that the history of African-Americans had to be taught in all schools across the country, not just schools where we had a large population or not just schools that we went to, but he felt that everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, 
needed to understand African American history. And he's absolutely correct. And, the, and, and one of the reasons why is because the way you treat a people is largely based upon what you think about a people. What you think about a people is largely based upon what you know about a people. What you know about a people is largely based upon what you've read, heard, and seen about a people. So if you have negative stereotypical images of African Americans that are, that are projected, and African American history is not taught in a lot of schools across the country, or if it is taught, is very shallow, very watered down, and it centers around slavery and the civil rights movement. It doesn't focus on the accomplishments and achievements of African Americans. It doesn't, it doesn't deal with civilizations that African people ruled prior to slavery beginning, whether we talk about Ghana, Songhai, Mali, whether we talk about Great Zimbabwe, whether we talk about uh, in Southern Africa, uh, whether we're talking about uh, uh, Nubia, ta uh, uh, uh ancient Kemet, Abyssinia, any, any, any of these various civilizations. We talk about Axum, uh, we, 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 whether we deal with uh, uh, Carthage, Hannibal Barca and, and the Carthaginians. If, you, if you're framing our history based upon being conquered by Europeans and in shackles and chains and brought to this country. This is, this is one of the problems I have with the 1619 Project, even though there, there are some good things in there. Is it, my, my argument is, is even the history of this country does not start with the enslavement of African people. So why are you starting... Why, why are you starting out with the enslavement of African people in this country? Af African people have been in this country going back tens of thousands of years ago. Yes, 1619 happened. Yes, it's important to understand. But let's start at the beginning. Let's deal with the fact that this was our land stolen from us. And, and once we get that foundation in place, then it will cause us to have a seismic shift in our Thoughts, feelings, actions, and behaviors. Your thoughts create feelings. Your actions, your, your thoughts create feelings. Um, your, your, your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. When we, when we understand that we did not first come here conquering and shackled in chains, when we stop saying things like Columbus discovered America and, and Columbus never came to this land that we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is about 90 miles away. This land mass that we call the United States of America or what Native Americans call Turtle Island. Colum Christopher Columbus never even set foot on this land mass. When, when, we, when we start dispelling all these myths, we can, we can get to the truth. All right, I see you all posting comments. Go ahead and go ahead and keep posting your comments. We'll come to them in just a second, okay? Because uh, you know, you know how I am. I could be here all day, and I, I don't. <laughs> I got to. I had to get ready for. I had to teach a class tomorrow. I got to get ready for my radio show on Sunday, uh, nine p.m., eleven p.m., nine p.m. to eleven p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. The African History Network show. So, um, but we'll come to your comments here in just a second. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? Give us a. a uh, you can give us some feedback here and uh, go ahead and post your comments also. All right. And uh, if you want to support the African History Network, uh, you can do so uh, through PayPal or Cash App. It takes a lot to finance the African History Network, uh, cover the expenses, pay for uh, uh, cover the expenses, etc. cetera. And uh, so if you want to support the African History Network, you can dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And also, I'm going to give you the link here for uh, the new um, uh, our new online um, history class is going to start up next Saturday. Um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, what they didn't teach you in school, uh, class number one starts up next Saturday. So we, we get deep into uh, all of this history here. And uh, let me see here. I'm going to post the link for that. Where is that? Uh, so I just created the class, and uh, we'll, we'll give you an overview of that also. 
All right, let's continue here. Okay, yeah, here's the link for it. Okay, and that and that course is uh, on sale eighty dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. I just posted a link here for it. Okay, Doctor Woodson hoped that Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year. Dr. Woodson hoped that Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year, as he affirmed from time to time. He never meant it for it to be the only time of the year that we study our history. He never meant it to be the only time of the year that we study our history. I repeat, Dr. Woodson never meant for Negro History Week or the month of February to be the only time of the year that we study our history. So when I hear people say things like, uh, you can't relegate our history to one month or why we have the coldest month of the year, the shortest month of the year, that we don't understand the history of Black History Month. Okay, let's continue. And I'll give you the link so you can read the extensive article that I've written on this as well. Okay, Damu said, history is on point. Your criticism of the 1619 Project is a bit flawed in logic. It's okay for a scholar to focus on one part of history, especially to demonstrate its origin of the modern-day prison industrial complex. Okay, that's part of the fallacy. Go, go watch the two-hour interview that I did with uh, Dr. Daryl uh, Scott, who is a former history professor at Howard University. Now he's at, uh, where's Daryl at? Uh, he's at, uh, uh, is it Morgan State now? That, 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 that's, that's part of the flawed history. The modern, the, the, the industrial prison complex is not related to slavery. That's part of the that, that's part of the flawed history. The reason why it's a flawed understanding of history is because the 13th Amendment is based upon the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. How many of y'all have heard of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787? The exact the, basically the exact language of the 13th Amendment already applied to white people. It already applied to white men. That's the North, go research the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And what they're doing is they're given the same rights that white people had. They're giving those to African Americans. And, and th so then 1866, you have the civil rights act of 1866. Okay. Because the civil rights act of 1865 got vetoed by uh, president Andrew Johnson. Civil rights act of 1866 gets passed. Uh, they, they overruled Johnson's veto. Okay, this is after Lincoln was assassinated. Okay, then you're going to have the 14th Amendment of 1868. You're going to have the Voting Rights Act. You're going to have the uh, 15th Amendment of 1870. And what they're what they're doing is giving to African Americans who were put into a uh, status of chattel. They're giving to them the same rights that white people already had. See, people. So I hear people keep putting forth this myth. OK, now, when you actually understand uh, the, the prison industry in this country and when the uh, when you start really having a big increase in the amount of people in prison, you go back to 1970. There were only about 300,000 people in prison in 1970. There's only about 300,000 people. There, there were very low numbers of people in prison. Did we did African-Americans disproportionately? make up the number of people in prison? Yes. But people skip over June 17th, 1971. You know what happened June 17th, 1971? Richard Nixon declared his war on drugs. And the U.S. prison population quadruples from 1971 to 1993. People think it's because of the 94, the 1994 um, crime bill. Crime bill wasn't signed in the law to September 13th, 1994. They skip over from 71 to 93 when the U.S. prison population quadruples. 
it goes from 300,000 approximately in 1971 to 1.4 million in 1993. Go to BJS, BJS.gov, Bureau of Justice Statistics. Or you can go to the U.S. Bureau, um, US Bureau of Prisons and you can look at the numbers of people in prison year after year after year and you see this huge increase. Okay, so if the 13th Amendment is what caused mass incarceration, why did it take 106 years to do that? 13th Amendment was put in place in 1865. Why did it take 106 years for mass incarceration to happen? See, these, these, are, the types, these are the types of myths that float around. This is this is one of the problems with the this is one of the problems with the documentary thir uh, um, uh, thirteenth from Ava DuVernay. I like Ava DuVernay, but the the documentary is is grossly flawed. It's a gross misunderstanding of history. And this is something I talked to Dr. Daryl Scott about. Because and 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 Dr. Daryl Scott taught a taught a class at Howard University on um it was called what is it called uh. Uh, he was dealing with slavery and mass incarceration, things like this. And in the, in the class, he has to go through, he would talk about how each year when he gets new students in, especially if he had freshmen in, he had to go through and, 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 and just dispel all these myths that they come into class with. So, so and, and th this is one of the problems when you have people who are trying to get uh, bills passed to abolish the 13th Amendment in states. This is in the 2022 midterm elections. You had states that were trying to uh, abolish the 13th Amendment. And I've talked to people who, who are trying to get to abolish things like this, and they talk about states where they've got it abolished before. I asked them a very simple question. Okay, so in the states where you got the 13th Amendment abolished, how many people, you, so, so, you say, so you say slavery is still legal, and you're saying, okay, there's a relationship between the 13th Amendment and the U.S. prison population, and mass incarceration, all this stuff, all right? Okay, so let me ask you a question. How many people were slaves before you got the 13th Amendment abolished in those states? And then how many people were freed the next day after you got the 13th Amendment abolished? How many people, if, you, if, if you're saying that the 13th Amendment still legally enslaves people, and you're saying we need to abolish it. Okay. What was the effect in those states of you abolishing it? How many people were freed the next day after it was abolished? How many people were freed the next month? How many people were freed the next year? Not because they were scheduled to be paroled, but because you abolished the 13th Amendment. Where's your evidence? How many privatized prisons did you get shut down in those states because you abolished the 13th Amendment? If you're saying that the privatized prisons, if you if you if you are if you are saying the reason why the privatized prisons can quote unquote enslave people is because of the 13th Amendment, then in those states where you got it abolished, how many of those privatized prisons did you get shut down? How many prisons did you get shut down? Show me what changed after you abolished what you said caused all this. We're confusing changing language with with actually changing laws that have some type of impact we're confusing the two because we don't understand history this is the difference this is this is the difference between understanding activity and productivity when you don't understand history and law you get caught up in activities that don't produce results a lot of those people, a lot of those people mean well. A lot of those people are committed to mean well. They don't understand history and law. And most of our people have never heard of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 because most of our people don't understand history. Okay. Let's continue. Dr. Woodson hoped that Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year as he affirmed from time to time. Dr. Woodson consistently instructed those observing, observing the week that they needed to diligently prepare for the celebration months in advance and that after mid-February, 
they needed to continue acknowledging the role of African descendants in the world, in, in world history. So he's talking about year round. The whole way, largely, largely the whole way that we celebrate Black History Month is wrong. One, we don't honor Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Don't deal with his history. Don't talk about the Association for the Study of African, Amer African American Life and History, which started out as Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Don't deal with any of that. Don't deal with the annual theme. And it's been the annual theme since 1928. I'm going to come to the annual theme in just a minute. We're going to go through and look at the annual theme because that, that annual theme, I would argue, helps to set a tone for the entire year and what you focus on the entire year, not just the month of February. Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year and at the same time a demonstration of greater things to be accomplished. Dr. This is what Dr. Woodson instructed teachers. He said, quote, a subject which receives attention one week out of the 36 will not mean much to anyone. Because when you research him and, 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 and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Payroll Gaglo Dag Dagbovi, Michigan State University history professor in the history department. I met Dagbovi. I bought his book. Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., The Father of Black History. Read that book. Because our whole understanding largely of this is backwards. And, and Woodson was saying, look, you, gotta, you have to teach this history to our children year round and other children year round. He, he said that that one week out of the year, second week in February, that should be a period of time when the children have, are demonstrating what they've been studying year round. And Dr. Woodson hoped that Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year. We will, where we would celebrate and study this history year round. Now I talked about the pyramid principle. Um, when two of my teachers teach, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor Jane Small, and Professor James Small is the um, historical consultant on my favorite TV show, Godfather of Harlem. On uh, It was on Epics, now it's MGM, uh, the MGM Studio app or MGM Studio channel, Godfather of Harlem. Uh, and God, how many people watch Godfather of Harlem? It deals with um, Fictitious encounters, some historical, but ficti but it deals with the relationship between Bumpy Johnson, gangster Bumpy Johnson, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., and Malcolm X in the 1960s in Harlem. It starts out in 1963 with um, Bumpy Johnson being released from prison. Okay, God Godfather of Harlem, fantastic show. And and so I'm trying to look at, I'm digging through a stack of books, a stack of books, looking for two books here. Um, Professor Jane Small is the historical consultant on the show. All right. Now, um, when we look at the pyramid principle, the foundation of the pyramid is African history and culture. It's African history and culture that gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests and our principles. This influences our economic empowerment and our political empowerment. OK, it, it engage it influences how we engage in economics, how we engage in business. The types of businesses we have, uh, the economic institutions that we have, things like this, that all comes from our understanding of history and culture. It's African history and culture that gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. This also engages, this also influences our political empowerment and how we engage in politics. 
and understanding political structures. Politics is more than just voting. Voting is, is very is very important, okay? Because the policies that we want to get put in place, somebody has to write the, that legislation and vote on that legislation, okay? So uh, voting is extremely important. But politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources and the, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. This is what politics is. Voting is one part of politics. It's a very Im important part of politics. But politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. And the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Your, your understanding of politics and laws and policies, things of this nature, is directly related to your understanding of history because they because they, they they all intersect they're all intertwined so if you don't understand history you're not going to understand politics you're not going to understand the laws that come about because of historical events historical conditions etc and laws and policies shape conditions out of those conditions you have movements that take place and the movements take place to address the conditions that were created by the laws and policies, and they work to get new laws and policies put in place to change conditions. So you have a cycle, and you have the connection between historical events, conditions, laws, and policies. Okay, so we have to understand all of that to understand how this works together to under, for us to understand how to... Uh, force an agenda one how to put together an agenda because your agenda consists of various laws and policies you want to put in place you have to understand history and law to be able to put together an agenda and then we have to leverage our economics to enforce our political agenda as well so we have to understand that process unfortunately many of us don't understand that okay now um, let's look at, let's look at this year's, uh, theme for black history month, African American history month. I'll come to your comments here in just a second. Okay. I want to, um, I want to get through this cause I have a lot of information to get through and I want to, um, kind of like stay, uh, on time. I don't want to go, I don't want to go too far over time. Um, cause I have a lot to, <laughs> I have a lot of information to get through. Also, I forgot to tell you what we're going to do, what I decided to do and putting, putting all this together. I always have more information at the time. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to make, um, we're going to do a presentation dealing with this year's theme of African American history month. We're going to do a presentation each Saturday in February. So the other presentations should be probably 12 noon on Saturday. So you'll get a notification from me about that. Um, also sign up for, sign up for my email newsletter. Um, text the word. If you don't already get it, the email newsletter from, uh, through constant contact, uh, text the word Kemet, K E M E T to two, two, eight, two, eight. Okay, text the word Kemet, uh, uh, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Okay, so this is going to be the first of, uh, let's see how many Saturdays we have in one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's going to be the first of four presentations I'm going to do this month dealing with um, African American History Month, this year's theme which is black resistance. So we're going to look at black resistance movements for the next four Saturdays. Okay. All right. Now let's look at this here and I have it up in. Let me pull this up. I thought I had the PDF up of it. Just a second here. Where is. Let me pull this up. I've got okay right here. I've got a lot of tabs open. Okay, here we here it is right here. And let me close some of this stuff out. 
because I'm flipping back and forth between um, Google Chrome and Firefox. So those that watch my show and take my classes, you you all know how, <laughs> how I do. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's look at this here. Uh, where are we? It's gonna be okay, right here. All right, so this comes from Asala, uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which is the organization that Carter G. Woodson co founded September 1915. This deals with this year annual, this year's annual theme of, um, for African American History Month, which is black resistance, black resistance. Uh, African Americans have resisted, and let me blow this, let me increase the size of this, so you should be able to see this all right. African Americans have resisted historic and uh, ongoing oppression in all forms, especially the racial terror, uh, especially the racial, racial terrorism of lynching, uh, racial pogroms, and police killings since uh, our arrival upon these shores. I will rephrase that and say since Europeans got here because African people are already here. Okay, you, you skip over the presence of the African Moors that were here also. Okay, um, and in, in my classes, we look at the um, Virginia Slave Codes of 1705 in Virginia. In the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705, make a distinction between Negroes and Moors because because African Moors were here. All right. So uh, now let's let's say since Europeans got here because they are the Johnny come lately's. These efforts have been to advocate for dignified, self-determined life in a just democratic society in the United States and beyond the United States political jurisdiction. The 1950s and 1970s in the United States was defined by actions such as sit-ins, boycotts, walkouts, strikes by um, African Americans and white allies in the fight for justice against discrimination in all sectors of society from employment to education to housing. Okay, 1950s, 60s, and 70s. African Americans have had to constantly push the United States to live up to its ideas of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Systemic oppression has sought to negate much of the dreams of our griots like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and our freedom fighters like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Septima Clark, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Okay, and Fannie Lou Hamer uh, fought to realize African Americans have sought ways to nurture and protect uh, black lives and for autonomy of their physical and intellectual bodies through armed resistance, voluntary immigration, uh, non voluntary leaving the country, voluntary immigration, nonviolence, education, literature, sports, media, and legislation uh, and politics. African Americans led institutions and affiliations have lobbied, litigated, legislated, protested, and achieved success. Okay, now when they go to, let me see, when they said, let me just back up one quick second here. Bodies do, oh, armed, when they talk about armed resistance, there was, there was armed resistance during the civil rights movement. There was armed resistance during the civil rights movement. And we deal with this um, in um, the second class that I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1800 to 1968. It wasn't just the Deacons for Defense and Justice. If you read this book here, uh, hold on, where did I just put it? Right here. You read this book here, this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. How guns made the Civil Rights Movement possible. Let me see by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. He deals with this history in this book because a lot of the civil rights leaders that we talk about 
they all own guns. Dr. King owned, owned guns until Bayard Rustin convinced him to get rid of his guns. I think that was a bad move, but Dr. King owned guns. Dr. King tried to get a concealed pistol license in 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama during the Montgomery bus boycott because his house, his house was fi uh, firebombed twice in 1956, okay? Once in September and then once in is like late January late January 56 and then in September 1956 Dr. King's house was fired about twice Dr. King owned guns when you really understand that this this book right here and the armed resistance that African Americans waged during the civil rights movement and and we used guns to protect the civil rights workers because we knew we could not in, you generally speaking oftentimes we knew we, we could not we could not rely upon the local sheriffs and the local police to protect civil rights workers from the white supremacists, from the Ku Klux Klan, from the bigots, things like this. So we armed our, we formed groups, we armed ourselves and we protected the civil rights workers and protected ourselves. This nonviolent stuff would get you killed. How guns made the civil rights movement possible. Now, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr., okay, uh, is the author of this book and he was a field secretary for SNCC student nonviolent coordinating committee for five years in rural Mississippi, organizing African-Americans uh, uh, to register to vote and, and organizing for, you know, the, um, to say for the right to vote is not technically accurate because the 15th amendment guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. And then the 19th Amendment of 1920 guaranteed it for women. But in the Southern states, they passed laws and rewrote their state constitutions to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to be obstacles to the 15th Amendment. So you have these freedom movements that, that, that take place. You have these movements fighting for, they say for the right to vote, but they are they, they want their rights enforced. That's a, that's a that's a better way to say it, because the 15th Amendment. And the 19th Amendment already gave them those rights, but they're fighting to have the obstacles that were put in place to deny them their rights. They're fighting to get those removed. This is why you needed a Voting Rights Act. OK, because of what happened at the Mississippi State Convention of 1890 when they rewrite the state constitution to impose poll taxes and literacy tests in a, in a state that had a majority African-American population and African-Americans were the majority of the voters in the state of Mississippi in 1890, as a result of slavery, we were the majority of the population in Mississippi. Okay. So, um, it's, it's, so this is why understanding history is so important. If you, I'm gonna come back to this here in just a second, but if you look at uh, the article from uh, the Washington Post, this deals with uh, what's known as the Mississippi Plan, and this deals with the Mississippi State uh, Convention of 1890. And you hear me talk about this a lot. This is where Isaiah T. Montgomery, who was the only African American in the uh, uh, at the Mississippi State Convention, he voted along with the white supremacists to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the votes of African Americans. Now his vote would not have made a difference, but at least stand on principle. Okay, this is why I say uh, Senator Tim Scott out of South Carolina, the Negro who, who blocked the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in the Senate, I call, this is why I call him, you know, the modern day Isaiah T. Montgomery. Senator Tim Scott also voted against the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act as well. For those that don't know, he also voted against Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson being on the U.S. Supreme Court. For those that don't know. The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. We came here to exclude the Negro. Okay. Uh, so, so read that, read that article. This is from the Washington post. All right, let's go back to this here. How's everybody doing? 
Everybody all right? Are you learning anything? How you like this type of information? And you can post your questions and comments here. We're going to come back to your comments here in just a minute. Uh, okay, where, where, where did that one go? Hold on. Okay, right here. Okay, no, that's the wrong one. I want my... This is what I want right here. Okay, and if you like this type of information, you definitely want to register for my online class that starts up uh, uh, Saturday, February 11th. History Network information. Please support us. Please support us. All this does this, this not happen without resources. Okay, um, I do uh, a 12 week online course. We just had class number one that started up Saturday, February 11th. Uh, our next class is Saturday, February 18th. Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic trade where they didn't teach you in school. Class is Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You don't have to be present in the class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. A year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. Click right here to register for the full course. Uh, and, and here's the flyer for it. Uh, this is a, did a fantastic uh, class. Uh, it, it, as soon as you register, you class number one. We have a bundle pack of courses because uh, the second class that I teach starts up um, February 26, Sunday, February 26, class number one of From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1800 to 1968. So we get into the Civil War Reconstruction, what leads up to the Civil War taking place. Haitian Revolution, Louisiana Purchase of 1803, uh, Missouri Compromise of 1820, uh, Mexican-American War, 1846-1848, Texas winning its independence from Mexico, 1836, Mexico winning its independence from Spain, 1821, Kansas-Nebraska Act, 1854, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848, where the U.S. gets Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, and Nevada, all from Mexico for about $15 million. All of this leads up to the Civil War taking place. Now, I do uh, uh, on Saturdays, 12 noon to 1.30 p.m., I do a free Black History Month lecture for, for the month of February. If you missed uh, the, the previous uh, free lectures, uh, we have them archived here. You can click on them, register for them, and watch them. OK, and on the Saturday, February 18th, 12 noon to 1 30 p.m., dealing with black resistance movements, black resistance movements. Now, black resistance is the 2023 annual theme for African-American History Month. There's been an annual theme for African-American History Month dating back to 1928. OK, created by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who co-founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915 in Chicago. So we don't even most of us don't understand the history of Black History Month to understand how to properly utilize it. OK, we're not getting the full benefit of it because we don't understand the history and don't know that there's an annual theme for it, which gives you the context to have your celebration and give you topics to discuss and do presentations on, et cetera, in your celebration. All right. So most people don't don't know any of this. OK, so um, we have the information at our website, the African History Network dot com. And uh, I posted the uh, link there. So please, uh, please support us. And we have the information here in the thread of the broadcast. And I'm going to post the link here. You can register right here uh, for the uh, 12 week online course. How'd you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Please support the African History Network. Please support the African History Network. Definitely needs your support. It takes a lot of finances to do this. Register for uh, my, my online classes that I teach. We have a uh, class number two of Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Class number two starts, uh, it's uh, Saturday, February 18th, uh, 2023. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. 
you can go back and watch it anytime if you uh miss class number one uh that's not a problem it's archived you can go back and watch it and uh let me post this information here uh we have the information right on the home page of our website which is the african history network.com let me uh go back to this here Let's go back to the website. So as soon as you register, you can start watching the content. You go to our website, scroll down, you see information about my radio show. I'm on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. We have information with PayPal and Cash App here because people set up fake African History Network Cash App accounts. There's like five of them that I identified. So they've been stealing money from us. So that's why I had to put together this graphic. Our um cash app is dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w that's our cash app tab and when you go to it it'll say michael and it'll probably show my picture there people set up these fake african history network cash app accounts that have been stealing money from us uh i contacted cash app uh, a, a number of times they opened up an investigation that's slow as hell um dealing with this stuff okay so i gotta follow with them again uh, we have the free lecture Saturday, February 18th, 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. And then uh, also register for uh, my 12-week online course. Uh, class number two starts Saturday, February 18th, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's on sale $80, regularly $130. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, okay? And we deal with thousands of years of history, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. We have a bundle pack where you get both classes for $120. You get the first class and the second class that I teach uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1800 to 1968. Also, the, uh, when you register for uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, there'll be uh, there are five bonus lectures of mine that you'll get also five bonus lectures of mine that you'll get also they'll be in the video library okay all right so i'm gonna uh post the uh link here this takes you to the uh website for the uh class number what is this uh class number two Let's see. Uh, and actually, let's see, we have class number two. Um, OK, let me post this here and we'll put the link for the website also. And you, this information you could use with your children also in the courses. I would say the information is PG-13 um i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips uh we we, we I scan the pages of the book so we show you that on the screen so it's very visual um and some of the slides that i showed you a slide some of the slides the powerpoint slides those are some of the slides that i use in the classes as well all right so hopefully you learned a lot today share this uh with your friends follow us on our fan page the african history network uh, on Facebook, turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Follow me on YouTube, uh, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P on YouTube, and uh, support the African History Network because we definitely support you. Uh, remember, right now, let's correct.